Hello and welcome to Distance DevOps. Uh, I'm your host Rob Hirschfeld. This is a weekly series um, and uh, this week speaker is Dave McCrory but sadly I messed up the recording and we lost the f introduction um, about data gravity and him explaining what it is so I'll, I'll leave that to some of your imagination but we do pick up um, in his more detailed explanation some advanced concepts and then have a very lively discussion in which I promise you will find enlightening. So without further ado, Distance DevOps Lunch and Learn with Dave McCrory. Thank you. Not the best idea. So uh, again, same thing applies in the data center. If you're running some type of, uh, if you're running some type of app or something else and it relies on a large amount of data or if it relies on another uh, service, an API or what have you, the closer within the network you are to whatever you're trying to talk to, the better. So if you're fewer hops, if you have less latency, the more you can do and the faster you can do it. Uh, that, uh, that's kind of the overarching view of, uh, of data gravity. Uh, I've done a lot of uh, I've done a lot of research in the past uh, in the past couple of years in understanding um, kind of external drivers for data gravity um, and influences and influences are definitely demands um, out there as is IoT. I think another thing that uh, that's going to happen uh, that we will see in the next say five years is we're going to see an even bigger explosion of edge uh, becoming important um, in a whole host of different ways. We're going to see some interesting things happen because of 5G, uh, both, uh, both the general and the millimeter wave 5G. I think we'll also see some interesting, interesting things happen with, uh, with satellite internet or LEO if, uh, if you're following the low earth orbit uh, satellite based stuff. Uh, several of those internet services are supposed to turn on this year, and uh, I think that's going to greatly affect the landscape. There are uh, there's some go ahead. There's some other sorry. sorry go ahead. No, I, go I ahead. If there are questions, please. Yeah, I was going to ask about because five G strikes me as incredibly local, but low Earth orbit is still going to have speed of light. Uh, from a component, so latency, you know, bandwidth, is, is bandwidth going to be cheap in low Earth orbit, even if latency is high? So bandwidth, at least from what I've read, is going to be, um, bandwidth will be plenty and the speed will actually be surprisingly fast, um, much faster than, uh, than what we're used to with, say, Hughes or one of the other satellite internet style providers. It's going to be much faster. Um, because these are low Earth orbit uh, satellites in fixed positions, and it's over over I think it's five or seven years. Um, I know uh, whichever service Elon Musk is building, um, their intent is to create a mesh um, over the Earth of these uh, of these satellites. And so, if you imagine having a a fairly dense mesh that uh, that's covering the majority of the globe, um, so you end up with, yeah. that's right. And you end up with some really interesting, um, really interesting outcomes with, with stuff like that, a along with obviously more and more of the 5G equipment being deployed, which will, which will speed up the network, but it doesn't guarantee reliability. Um, there's still limits to what the network can do. And if you're dumping, um, you know, gigabytes to terabytes of data per second uh, still not going to work out uh, and in some cases you just can't risk reliability of the network for uh, for what you're doing so i think that's where it gets interesting uh, is oh, shane were you going to say something oh sorry yes um I, i'm actually curious because I, it seems like uh, where you started out in the conversation with data gravity um, and then moving into 5G uh, LEO satellite Earth orbit stuff, they're kind of at odds with each other uh, because uh, data gravity is something that's occurred because masses of data create their own gravity and attract the applications. Whereas when you distribute, which is what the um, low Earth orbit and 
5G millimeter wave is all about, you know, going out to the edge, you don't have data gravity anymore. And those seem to be two at odds in two competing sort of stories. You're generating data at the edge, but you don't have much gravity with that edge because there isn't a whole lot of that data. It's local, but data, big data is mostly, at least in my view, effective because it's sort of an aggregate of data from all, you know, a large amount of data from, you know, wide range of sources. So I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, <laughs> so uh, what I gave was, and, and what most people are familiar with, is the original definition of data gravity. Um, data gravity, um, in my mind, has evolved. Um, and I'm actually writing a book uh, about data gravity. Um, it's not titled data gravity, but uh, one of the one of the um, one of the important uh, aspects in it is about data gravity and data gravity is not just about masses of data. Um, if if you're familiar with the classic uh, E equals MC square, in that case, you're talking about um, energy and energy being equal to um, matter times the speed of light. And I believe the same thing applies to data gravity. There are two aspects to data gravity. There's the actual mass of data. So you've accumulated this, you know, terabit, petabit, exabit, uh, uh, you know, size amount of data in a location. But I think there's another, uh, there's another factor in that is energy. So you can think of energy as um, the amount of processing or the amount of um, overall activity that's taking place. And uh, that is equivalent to having a large amount of data. And in fact, without, uh, without that processing taking place, you really don't have value. And there's really no reason to go and, uh, and fetch data. So, you know, I could have uh, I could have an unlimited amount of data, and if it's all stored on hard drives on on shelves with no power or anything provided to them, there's no real gravitational effect there. It's it's just a bunch of disks. Uh, it's the it's the you know it's the energy side that of the equation that really um, that really drives things, and and so the discussion and in rolling into five G and Leo and other things is the ability to initiate that activity. Um, increases exponentially with uh, with these faster and, and more available networks, uh, including in places that uh, were really disconnected. I think uh, I think that's going to be another factor as well. And by the way, all of that activity creates more data. But Dave, just real quick, and I don't know how much, how well this plays into your what you're talking about, but. You mentioned like Elon Musk and SpaceX and things like that, of course. At the rate that they're um, deploying satellites, does that, do you, how, what is your view on that as in regards to data gravity, the amount of data? Um, like I say, I may have not have phrased that comment in the right way, but I think you probably understand exactly where I'm going with that. Sure, the more, the more satellites you deploy, um, the greater the capacity for activity, the increased gravity, and you could argue that um, uh, you could argue that the that network itself has a gravitational effect, and you're attracted to that network by uh, by the capabilities it provides and by the activity that's happening on it. And so, if you had say access exclusively to bits of data or to uh, to reach points on a network that you can't go across anywhere else, you're going to want to run on uh, on that network. And that network happens to offer capabilities, um, you know, that as far as access, where you'll ultimately be able to go almost anywhere in the world and be connected to the internet. Um, and again, every time we connect, every time we do anything we are generating data. It's uh, an incredibly rare circumstance for us to not be. Good stuff. Yeah, this is really interesting to me because I, I, I honestly know very little about the topics you're talking about, but that's just something that popped in my head is, you know, I, this, is, this is obviously, like you say, for the better part of a decade, you've been working 
on these on the research and things like that it's it's definitely an issue for sure i mean i think the I think, at least in my mind, the goal behind uh, what I've been doing is to get people to better understand uh, data in this way versus understanding, you know, uh, how how do I better organize or optimize my my database or my Cassandra cluster or you know how do I uh, how do I deal with uh, with quote unquote the data deluge because I have uh, these Hadoop clusters or what have you. I think the I think the understanding of what and how data behaves and why it behaves that way and what you should do with data and how to work and measure data, um, I think some of that has been unsolved for a long time. And that's that's part of the effort behind the book is to help unravel a lot of these uh, a lot of these topics that no one um, no one's really tackled, or at least no one's thoroughly tackled and been able to get the word out. And I've certainly, I've certainly spent my time Googling and looking around uh, for quite a while now and have found very little um, on the subject. And when I do find things, it's um, what I would call very light reading. It's like, well, what should you do with your data? Well, you should look at security and governance and compliance. But it, what does that mean? How do I go do that? But what are the steps to go do those things? You never see that. You just hear high level topics, but no, no kind of meat or ability to take action beneath it. And uh, I'm more interested in, okay, show me the concept and then show me how to use that for something, something that provides me with, uh, with insight or some kind of uh, uh, understanding or something where I can improve my system or optimize it or make it better or uh, do things, but give me an ability to, to take action. Now, do you think it's because people aren't talking about it or is that, do you think that it's because people don't talk about it because they don't really understand the concept and what it means to them or anyone around them? I, I, think, people, um, I think people think that they understand Sure. And uh, and I think they have just left it alone, and no one has really gone to look and understand. Um, I'll, I'll give you a great example of something that um, that people believe they understand. I've seen a lot of debate, and I've seen no one provide um, a solid explanation on, uh, and that would be um, what happens to uh, to the value of a uh, of a piece of data over time. So. I've seen probably a dozen different explanations. I've seen people talk about uh, data, um, data decay or data half-life. I've seen people talk about um, the value falling. I've seen people even argue, well, the value can increase. Um, I've seen all sorts of things, but I've not seen someone provide um, a definitive explanation of what happens. Um, and by the way, there's no, um, there is no recognized way of placing value on data today, um, at least from an accounting perspective. So if you look at the accounting industry standards, uh, there is nothing that addresses uh, data's value. Um, there are people that say it should be valued as an asset. There are people that say you can't value it as an asset. Uh, these are all things that are listed out there, but no one said, okay, this is absolutely a, a proven way to do it. That, and this is just a tiny example of one of the things that, uh, that I've spent a long time researching and, and understanding. And it fascinates me that, uh, that this problem still exists today. Where, Dave, where do you think it sits in terms of the organization? Like it's very simple, like for me as a, uh, a CISO or, you know, um, in terms of security and, and I see that, you know, tying into what you're talking about that way. But in terms of who needs to take ownership within an organization on this, where do you think that sits? Or does it? I think it's the responsibility of the C-suite. Um, and uh, I, I don't say, oh, well, it's the CIO or it's the CTO or the CSO or the CDO, depending on if you have one of those. I, I don't, I don't see that being the, um, I don't see that being the case. I think the problem is that everyone needs to be educated because 
most business models are moving um, are moving to become data centric, and mm. uh, you know I don't care if you um, you know if you're a bakery and you bake um, you bake bread in mass you know you have a huge production line that that makes bread or if you're a high tech company or uh, anything in between more and more your business is about data and if you don't understand um really how you can use data and what you should be doing and what valuable data you have then you're at risk and you can't make good decisions and that doesn't mean um the oh you need to take and build a giant cluster throw all your data into a data lake and then get quote unquote insights from that it's uh I think it's more fundamental than that. And I think one of the reasons why we didn't really see the, uh, the huge revolutionary changes out of the, uh, out of the big data, um, what I'll call the big data wave that, uh, that happened um, over the last decade was because businesses still don't understand the fundamentals about their data because we don't have even the, the most basic uh, rules the C-suite doesn't understand. So how are they possibly going to derive all of these huge benefits um, if they don't even know what the right data to look at is or what the valuable data is that they have? Uh, it becomes and, basically a fundamental, we don't know what we're sitting on, so what do we do? That's right, that's right. If you're sitting, if you're sitting on top of a mine that's, um, that's, let's say you were sitting on top of a platinum mine but you think the most valuable metal's gold, um, it, you don't even realize to go and look for that platinum and start uh, start collecting and selling it. And meanwhile, uh, you're looking for gold and it's the wrong thing because there is no gold underneath you right now. Um, I, I would argue the same thing with data. If, you, if you're looking for uh, one bit of data, um, even if you happen upon quote unquote the right data that's even more valuable, how are you going to know that? So I have a question based on that and something Larry was talking with you about earlier. Um, because I think the mining um, example is really great. Like what if the entire industry has shifted and there's no value to mining for a precious metal anymore, that you have to do things a different way? Um, how, how much do you think that education needs to be about um, just a, a, a change in concept of, of how we sell data, data systems from an enterprise um, solutions level and how companies use data and what data actually could mean to them. Um, so I see it as two different, I see it as two, two questions rolled into one, um, mm -hmm. but, but they're both uh, highly, highly relevant. I think that the, uh, to answer the first question, uh, around uh, around value to the business and understanding if things changed, um, how do you know what to do? I think that's where the C-suite has to understand the fundamentals about the data and how it ties to their business. And if you understand that and things are shifting beneath you, you can make strategic decisions. Um, and with those strategic decisions, you can, uh, you can, alter, monitor, et cetera, where you need to go. And you need the ability, by the way, to measure and monitor that. And there are no known mechanisms to measure that except to see how the business is doing overall. So there's no way to, no way to measure this as of today. And, and also, uh, there hasn't been a lot of interest in data strategy. Um, I did a lot of research and in looking into uh, data strategy and there was, uh, there was a company in Silicon Valley that attempted to really push uh, businesses to start doing data strategy and strategizing about their data. And uh, it didn't work out. And it's because businesses think they already know and that there is no need to create a data strategy. There's no reason to, to do these things. And um, I think they're sorely mistaken, but, uh, but they haven't bothered to look. And um, I think that's part of the problem. And I think that's why uh, there are quite a few businesses that are leaving millions to billions on the table every day because they 
don't understand uh, that that platinum is sitting there and they're still looking for the gold. Now, if we talk about the storage side, which I think was the other topic that you mentioned, Gina, I, I would say that um, I would say that enterprise storage, um, really someone that's selling enterprise storage or consuming enterprise storage needs to begin to better understand the behavioral patterns of the data and uh, and in order to do that, either the customer has to be willing to kind of open up and and give you the insight, or uh, you have to be able to go and discover the insight into what uh, what and how that data works. And that's part of that's part of the effort uh, in my book is is focused on enabling things like that. And actually, when I say enabling, I mean giving you step by step how to do it. And I think that's, uh, again, I think that's what's been missing. There are people that have talked about some of this before, so I'm not saying I'm the first person to ever talk about any of these things. You are. But I think. <laughs> <laughs> but it was a, lot, a long time ago when people caught up. <laughs> yeah. However, I'll say nobody ever gives you the steps. They basically just yeah. do a bunch of hand waving and, and send you on your way. And uh I don't believe in doing that. I believe in, uh, if at all possible, giving people do this. And then once you have that result, then you can do this step. And if you had that step by step, you're much more likely to end up uh, with a successful outcome. But I, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm joking and I'm not joking at the same time, Dave, but I mean, I, I do think quantifying this is appropriate, right? That, that to me is the difference between saying I've got data and I can understand. It's like it's like the change that happened when we got seismic analysis with you know geology. They stopped just r drilling random holes in the ground. That's right. Um, and so, you know, what what you're describing is much more precision around understanding the data. the The thing that when we've talked about this in the past starts being like just a, a high hurdle though is understanding like your your value per transaction or your costs per transaction. Like, so if we're going back to the mining operations that, you know, extracting that, the, the value in that data does cost something. There is a, right, there's latency, but there's also cost in transforming data or extracting it. How, you know, is um, that? I would say, I would say, yes, there can be. Um, the cost can be close to zero or the cost can be astronomically high. Uh, and, uh, you know, the, the example of something incredibly low cost would be um, a, a, simple, a simple copy or a, or a transfer of data that already exists, especially if it's a small amount of data, um, you get to something that might work out to be um, less than one one thousandth of a cent in cost. Well, at that point, um, probably not a big issue. Um, and so what happens is uh, companies where uh, they have situations where that's the, the type of cost, it gets ignored. Where it doesn't get ignored is where it's what I would call that hard earned data. And I would use, uh, say, um, you know, one of the financial uh, services companies, uh, and, and I won't name them, I'll just say pick any of them, because they all do, uh, you know, do say, um, algorithmic trading, or they do uh, anything else, you can think of hedge funds as well. And when they get insight into uh, a market, or they get a bit of data and perform uh, a deep analysis, that gets expensive. And that's, uh, that, that expense, um, is an investment that they hope to reap a return on. And that's what really, uh, that's really what all of this ends up being. It's how, what is your investment versus what's your return. And in their case, they know they're going to get a big return and they're willing to spend big, big money because they're going to get big, big returns. Um, right. It gets fuzzier and fuzzier the more we trend towards that one one thousandth of a cent and such. Um, the companies that have been really good at doing that and, and driving their, uh, their costs low and reaping big, big rewards would be someone like, um, you know, social media, like say a Facebook or someone. Um, and oh, exactly. uh, 
You mean like a like being a tiny transaction that generates actually an aggregate huge value for them? That's correct. That's exactly right. But isn't there also the risk of not knowing what you should, what you have and what knowing, not knowing um, what you can find from the data and that being something that can um, have really severe financial consequences down the road? It is. And, and so what has been done up to this point to hedge against that is for people to try and keep everything in perpetuity. And that's, that's the hedge. That's why you have a gigantic data lake that has data sitting in it that has never been touched and may never be touched is for that very reason, because there's no representation to tell me I could be sitting on gold or platinum or, or, you know, something else. And I just don't know it right now. And do I want to take the risk that if I deleted that data permanently, um, and then I find out a year later that if I just had that, I would have, you know, I would have a billion dollars worth of value. Um, it, that's, that's what's driving it. Right. And I was kind of thinking about oil and gas as well, right? So they've got, you know, centuries old weather maps and maps from ships and all sorts of data that's, um, that they just, you know, recently past several years had the technology to actually combine that data with new things that they're doing to keep up to date. So I think there's, there's all sorts of ways that maybe we don't have the technology to get into the data yet, but um, yeah, you have to run into that, that problem of hoarding data. Well, and I, and I think that's, I think that's true. I think what you're describing though is they had this information, but it wasn't what I'll call a, a digital or it wasn't uh, available uh, with the other bits of data. And so you're talking about combining data and then deriving value out of it. And I agree with that. Uh, the, uh, the, I think the interesting thing is understanding um, how all of that works and understanding the mechanics of, uh, of how they were able to do that and how they, how they got the value and why. Um, that is very poorly understood. Um, and that, I think that's the big issue. If you understood how that worked, if you understood why it worked, uh, then you could make better choices and you could make uh, better decisions on the data you should keep. What's likely going to actually in the future provide value? Um, why would it provide value? Do you have things sitting around like they did that should be put in electronically and made available and wasn't for whatever reason, or maybe there's a barrier, but you know that, all right, we know we're going to be able to convert that over. It might be five or 10 years, but we'll be able to do it. We're just going to keep it off to the side and anything that we think it might influence, we're going to keep that too for now. And once we convert it over, if we get value, great. And if we don't, then we know that it's time to just dump it all because we're not going to get value out of it ever. So two, two things back to you. Number one is I think there's also a societal justice kind of question and, and, and even just kind of um, bad actor kind of question, like what if you dump data that shouldn't be dumped that, that really should be brought to light? But the second bigger question is, is the explanation in your book? Yes, the explanation is, <laughs> is in the book. Um, I, uh, to say I've, uh, I've researched this to death is, uh, is probably putting it mildly. Um, I'm, uh, I am working on the book. Uh, I, hope to have it, uh, I hope to have it finished um, before the end of the year. Um, and I have all of the research and such finished. It's more of a matter of finding time and forcing myself uh, to write, which, uh, which is probably equally challenging compared to the research. Um, but I have been writing, so uh, it, it is moving along. Um, as to the bad actor side and the, um, and the deletion of data that maybe shouldn't be deleted and such, um, we already have that happen. Um, in, in other cases outside of data and, uh, and we're able to, uh, to deal with it. And, so, and I'll give you a great example. Uh, look at property. Uh, and, and I mean like look at a home or a building. Uh, there are 
there are cases where homes and buildings are destroyed from earthquakes, fires, uh, all sorts of other terrible things. Um, and then there are uh, then there are homes and property that are destroyed intentionally by, say, an arsonist or something else. Um, those things get destroyed and they cannot be magically brought back, um, especially contents inside those things. And uh, that exists with data. But there comes a point where you decide maybe a building is better off to be condemned than for you to keep it around due to all sorts of things, including, by the way, potential danger. And it could be as a company that you're holding on to data in hopes that it could one day um, be used as an advantage, but it could even more easily be a disadvantage. And maybe you'd be better off deleting it um, than keeping it online somewhere. Um, so there are different aspects uh, to, uh, to, how, to how data works that again, people don't really look at. They, they think it's free. They think that you can keep it forever um, and that there's no cost or impact for doing that, uh, no matter what the scale is. And it's just not true. And with that, <laughs> we are at the top of the hour. Uh, oh my goodness, we could go another hour without even blinking because I have a list of, five, of edge questions that we didn't, we didn't get back to. Um, Wow, Dave, thank you. Would you be interested in a couple of weeks coming back? Sure, I think that would be great. Topic? Yeah, Every, absolutely. Uh, I love I love when I can sit back and like listen to other people ask the smart questions. It makes, makes my day on <laughs> Lunch and Learn like that. Thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Uh, everybody, this has been great. If you have suggestions for other people, uh, bring them. Uh, you know, this is designed to be an open open format, you know, come and talk and we'll uh, just have conversations every week. Cool. All right, everybody. Thank you. I'll see you next week. Thank you.